Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this very, very important uh, webinar with um, our fantastic editor and two wonderful guests who tell us a lot of things about extreme weather and, and insurance, something that's on a lot of people's minds right now with the aftermath of Helene and Milton barreling towards uh, Sarasota and Tampa right now. I'm Beth Daly. I'm the executive editor and general manager of The Conversation. I want to welcome you. For those who are new to The Conversation, we are a very unique kind of journalism entity. Our mission is to democratize knowledge for the public good. And we do that by going to universities and finding researchers working on important subjects and asking them to write for the general public. They do that with our editors. They collaborate together. The story is published. Everything we publish, about 12 stories a day, is free for anyone to read and republish again. And we're in about 1,000 news outlets a month and about 15 million readers. Um, and so we're grateful that you found us here today. Um, I just want to remind people that everyone is muted. If you have a uh, comment or a question, you can put it right into the Q&A and they'll be getting in a line. And we hope to have a real interactive dialogue today. Um, I can't be more happy to uh, introduce Jennifer Weeks as your moderator today. Um, Jenny's covered environment, science and health for more than a decade. Um, as a freelance journalist before joining the conversation in 2015. She, her work's been in the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, Popular Mechanics, Audubon, Discover. She really knows her stuff. Um, uh, previously, Jenny was a congressional aide, a public interest lobbyist, and policy analyst. She holds a BA in history from Williams College, an MA in political science from the University of North Carolina, and to wrap it all up, an MPA from the Harvard Kennedy School. So Jenny, I'm gonna hand the conversation over to you and I'm gonna get myself off screen and listen in. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, and thanks so much to Andy and Melanie for joining us. Um, I know that uh, a lot of us have Florida on our minds, You know, whether you're there, if you're there, you're probably hunkered down actually, but um, you know, if, whether you're there, you know people there or you just like to go to Florida, um, I think we all, um, join in hoping that uh, Milton passes quickly over there and that the damage is minimal. Um, but it, it is a very appropriate time to be thinking about disasters and insurance. So that's what we're going to do. Um, I'm so excited to have Andy and Melanie here. And I should also say that our other environment editor, my colleague Stacy Morford is here too. She is um, part of, is, is um, monitoring, going to be monitoring your comments and may answer some of your questions directly. Stacy actually leads our disaster coverage. So she and I work closely together on keeping on top of all these things and figuring out what they mean. So um, it's a really, it's a very busy desk and we um, have a lot to do. Um, let me just quickly give you some background on Andy and Melanie, and then we will share a little bit of information just to get to set the scene a little bit for talking about major disasters and insurance, and then get into discussion. Um, Andy first, Andy Hoffman is the Wholesome U.S. Professor of Sustainable Enterprise at the University of Michigan. He has joint appointments in the Ross School of Business and the School of Environment and Sustainability. Andy has written extensively about corporate responses to climate change, how the interconnected networks of non-government organizations and corporations influence change processes, and the underlying cultural values that are engaged when these barriers are overcome. His research uses a sociological perspective to understand the cultural and institutional aspects of environmental issues for organizations. In particular, he focuses on the processes by which environmental issues both emerge and evolve as social, political, and managerial issues. Andy has worked with organizations in both the public and the private sectors, including um, organizations like Accenture, Dow Chemical, the Environmental Defense Fund, Exxon Mobil, Novartis, the Nature Conservancy, and the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Um, Melanie is an assistant professor in the School of Public Affairs at Arizona State University, where she co-directs the Center for Emergency Management and Homeland Security, and manages the Spatial Hazard Events and Losses Database for the United States. She is a trained hazards geographer studying the interaction between natural hazards and society, her expertise is in risk metrics, such as disaster losses, indices, and risk assessments, hazard mitigation, and climate change adaptation planning, as well as environmental modeling. She is a certified floodplain manager and has conducted post-disaster field work in Mozambique, Haiti, and the U.S. Maybe, Melanie, we can hear a little bit about where you've done post-disaster field work in the U.S. 
at some point during the conversation. So anyway, we have two great experts here uh, really thinking about um, in weather extremes and disasters and insurance from different perspectives. And we thought we would start with just a couple of images to sort of sketch the picture that we're looking at here. So um, Priyanka, if you can put that first one up, the graph or the chart. Okay. Um, NOAA, which is the U.S. federal agency that does ocean science and also manages the National Weather Service, uh, has started putting out reports every year on what it calls billion dollar weather and climate disasters, which are what they sound like, disasters where the estimated damages are at least a billion dollars. This is the um, most current one for 2023. And I thought it would be useful to share this to just help people see that, you know, we've heard a lot about Florida and the Southeast over the last few weeks with this back-to-back -back, um, pair of hurricanes. Sometimes we hear a lot about wildfires in the West when it's a big deal, but um, I'm sorry to break it to those of you in the Northeast and the Midwest and the Plains, you are just as much in, in, on target for billion dollar disasters as people in other parts of the country. And so if you see, looking across the map here, you can see um, heat waves and droughts, flooding, hail, hurricanes, severe weather, which basically can mean like giant outbreaks of thunderstorms and things like that, tornado outbreaks, wildfires, and winter storms and cold waves. Um, if you go online, you can look at billion dollar disaster maps for years going back, and you'll see that the um, types of disasters may move around, the areas that are hit move around, but there are a lot of them every year. Um, and so now if we can switch to the other one, the chart, that would be great. Um, this is a running tab that NOAA is keeping of billion dollar disaster events over the last 40 years, and the um, vertical bars are just measuring the numbers of events. Um, they're color coded for different types, so you can see that the mix tends to shift around from year to year, but you can see that the trend is very clearly rising. Um, so these events are devastating and they are becoming more frequent and they are driven by many types of extreme weather. Um, we will try and put the links to these charts in the, um, the chat if anybody wants to look them up. But if you just Google US billion dollar disasters, it's quite easy to find this information and there's a lot of interesting discussion with it. So thanks Priyanka. Okay, um, to start out with, um, since I've just given Andy and Melanie's backgrounds and clearly you both have a lot of work going in this, this um, sphere, um, I wondered if each of you could talk a little bit about where does insurance fit into the larger issues that you're studying? You know, in what context does it come up? Just tell us a little bit about that. Why don't you go first, Andy? Okay, well, I sit in a business school, so I study the economy and business within it. And uh, the economy rests on the shoulders of insurance. You can't do anything without insurance. You can't get a mortgage. You can't build a house. You can't build a building. You can't drive a car. Insurance makes everything possible. And insurance, to my mind, is uh, the canary in the coal mine when it comes to climate change. They're monetizing it. They have no political dog in this fight. They're just looking at the numbers and balancing their 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 revenues and their and their payouts. And the payouts are going up. Therefore, the cost of premiums is going up. The coverage is becoming more limited, and people are forced to recognize that climate change is happening in the extent to which it is driving more severe weather. So I, I just think of it as an economic issue at, at its very basic root. Got it. Okay, thanks. Um, Melanie, how does it um, sort of pop up in your work? So I'm, a, as you said, I'm a geographer by training. And for me, insurance always comes in in two places because I do look at the interaction between society and nature. And so when you look at it in terms of reducing risks and the actions you can take to reduce risk as an individual, as a community, that's where insurance always comes in because insurance is a transfer mechanism of that risk. You're transferring your risk to the insurance companies. And the other aspect where insurance always pops up all the time is I look at um, the impacts of disasters. Why do people you know, experience more severe or, you know, stronger impacts from an event? Why are some people, you know, less prepared or can recover slower than others? And that's where insurance always comes in. Insurance is one of these key aspects. Like Andy said, if you don't have insurance, you will have an extremely hard time recovering or, or getting back anywhere close to where you were before the event. So it's a resource. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and then before we start getting into some of more of the specifics, I thought um, 
would each of you like to just sort of give one really central takeaway for listeners from this session? Um, because, you know, I mean, if people are going to come out with sort of one thing clear in mind that you'd like them to know, what would it be? Andy first. Um, insurance markets are in flux. Um, whether you're buying car insurance, home insurance, farm insurance, uh, no matter where you are in the country, uh, increasing storm severity, increasing storm frequency is changing the kind of coverage that insurance provides. The insurance the market will adjust, um, but it will come out in a very different form than it was before. And so you need to be watching this and you need to think about how, as Melanie said, reduce your risk. Insurance companies will be very willing to help you think about how to do that and building more resiliently, um, protecting your assets if you're a car dealer or how many cars are sitting outside in a uh, hailstone prone region. Um, insurance companies act as de facto consultants, uh, de facto regulations. If, if they won't insure your house, unless you do certain things, you will do those things or you will not get insurance. If you don't get insurance, you won't get a mortgage. If you don't get a mortgage, you don't have a house. Melanie, how about you? So to Andy's point, and we're kind of like saying, yes, you know, you need insurance. And I think it's really important to realize that neither Andy is an insurance guy, nor I am. But we both recognize, you know, how important it is to have insurance because it's the mechanism you really need to recover. There is no federal government expending, you know, millions of dollars to get people to where they were before. To me, the key takeaway, aside from, you know, knowing your insurance policy, what the fine print is and knowing your risks, is also... Um, knowledge about what you can do as a homeowner or as a renter practically in that property that you live in to reduce your risk. And that, you know, includes things like insurance on one hand, but also, for instance, if you're a, a homeowner, you know, do I have the right type of roof on my house for the environment that I live in? Because I think very often it's not necessarily something that we think about. We don't learn that. So I think if people could educate themselves more about what actions can I take aside from evacuation and putting up sandbags, like really what can I do physically to my home? I think that also would be like tremendously beneficial. Great, thanks for that. Yeah, and, and I'll just add to that, that depending on where you are um, in Cali much of California and much of the West where wildfires have been, uh, you know, one type of major disaster, many counties, require, but some just recommend things like landscaping around your house to reduce the risk of ignition of your house. So so it's so that the, the things you can do will depend on what the really sort of central risks are in different areas. Um, you know, in the southeast, it's major storms. So people are thinking about things like building houses that are resistant to high level winds and things like that. So so it is a lot of understanding what regional risks are and then thinking about what can you do to be ready for those. Um, and if but again, your insurance companies will be happy to point those out to you, I think, because they don't want to have to lay out and right. pay you, you know, if they don't have to. And if I could add one more dimension to this, Jenny, um, you know, real estate developers are seeing these transitions. There are developers, for example, in Florida that are building developments with uh, wetlands nearby for storm um, surge control, uh, burying their utilities, building the houses, uh, no foundation, which is quite typical in Florida because of the high water table, but a lot of hurricane bracing, um, private water systems. There are developments popping up now that are more climate resilient, hurricane resistant, storm resistant. Uh, there's a market being developed for this, and uh, that will be another transition we will start to see. Sure. Well, and so for anybody here, anybody in the, among the listeners who is looking now or might in the future be looking to buy property, um, thinking yep. about what kinds of um, extreme weather it could be exposed to and is the property designed um, to be really resilient to those is a really good question. So, right. great. All right. Um, so when NOAA develops these billion dollar disaster reports and puts out analysis of them and which ones were most expensive and things like that, they basically say, they, they point out that there are three things driving these disasters. Um, one of them is that climate change is increasing the frequency of extreme weather. Um, we're not really doing climate science here. We do other webinars on climate science. We'll probably do more, but there are other factors too. So it is not just climate change is doing all of this. Um, at the same time, you have increased exposure and more people have more assets at risk. Um, 
And then you have vulnerability, different place, people, different sets of people are more or less vulnerable in different places. So, so what, let's talk some about increased exposure and vulnerability. Um, Andy or Melanie, does one of you want to take those first? Take either or both of those. Well, I'll get started. Um, increased exposure. Uh, if we're having more frequent storms, more frequent weather events, they're going to hit uh, more populated centers. Um, and so that places more assets at risk. Construction costs are going up. These are more expensive assets. And some people are still building on coastal properties. Um, they still want that home looking out over the Gulf of Mexico or over the uh, east coast of Florida. And then they have the money to do it. They're putting them up. Uh, some cases they are able to find insurance, whether through the private market or sometimes through public markets, whether it's FEMA providing flood insurance. There is a, a backstop there, both at the state and the federal level, that some people are employing. Uh, so uh, the, the idea that these storms are becoming more severe, um, the consequences are more severe, not only because of the storm itself, but because of what the storms are hitting. And so- We're Still moving to the coast. <laughs> exactly. I was about to say that, Jenny. Okay, when you look Excuse at vulnerability, me. you have these two components. You have physical vulnerability, and that is, you know, putting yourself into a place that is at risk, like moving to Florida. And then on the other side, you have social vulnerability that you alluded to. And those are things where we, um, research shows that if you have, you know, less income, you just have less resources to evacuate ready your house, purchase insurance. So less income simply means you have really less resources to take protective actions of various kinds. And then we also very often see age. Age is a, a big factor that makes people more vulnerable. The young, the old, you have a lot of times, especially when, when people are older, you have maybe disabilities associated with it, people who are on oxygen at home, you know, if the power goes out, what do you do? And very often, if you're elderly, you don't necessarily want to move or get out of your house, move to a shelter, stay at a hotel. Right now, just when you turn on the TV, just this morning, I saw somebody on the Weather Channel where they said, you know, we are not leaving. You know, we don't really have the resources. There they were reports out about hotel prices being insanely high. And people just can't afford to evacuate, even if they wanted to. We saw it with Katrina. Katrina hit at the end of the month in August. And people, especially people on fixed income, had no resources to evacuate. And there's yes. many, many more aspects that make people vulnerable. But I think those two are probably the dominant factors. And, and if I can add to this, I mean, there's a lot of media now. It's, it's nice clickbait of climate refugees running from Florida, Texas, California. And and they're all running to Michigan, according to the news. Realtor.com just had a story this morning that the climate havens are all in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. Um, that's extreme. Some people are getting out. But to Melanie's point, a more subtle and 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 creeping effect of this is that People will try and sell their homes and find out there's very few buyers or the buyers are not offering what they wanted. That's where it's going to start to hit. And some of us can take the hit. You know, if I lose some money on my house, I can still sell it and get out. Some people, that's in their entire nest egg. Uh, or worse, they're underwater with their mortgage and they can't afford to let it go below a certain price. There was just a house in, in Massachusetts on the coast where the erosion was approaching it. It was on the market for 1.2. No insurance would touch it. A guy bought it for $300,000 knowing at some point in the future he will lose this asset. He can afford to do that. Most of us can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I've seen pointed out is that um, that a lot of coastal property is becoming owned by richer and richer people because they're the only ones who can really afford to grab it up and enjoy it at least for um, a limited time. So you see a lot of, of interesting shifting going on. I did a little um, looking to try to figure out where that climate refuge idea came from. And as far as I could tell, it was um, a researcher at the Harvard School of Design who was working on a sort of um, promotion and marketing uh, package for the city of Duluth, Minnesota, which people is way up on Lake Superior. And he was kind of jokingly saying, <laughs> we're a climate refuge because it's not hot here. But they sort of took it up and ran with it a bit. They weren't really, wasn't their lead thing. But it was, you know, the idea, it's colder here. You know, there's lots of water. We're not going to have a drought. But, you know, as we saw with that disaster map, I mean, they have big 
intense storms in the Midwest and the idea that there is some sort of place where everything's gonna be fine is really kind of misleading. So um, if you're looking for a climate refuge, uh, you are probably gonna be out of luck sooner or later. Um, mm -hmm. What do both of you expect to see happen to insurance markets coming out of Helen and Milton? Um, we don't know how severe Milton will be, but we can assume yeah. it's going to be pretty heavy damages. I mean, that, that that that's so hard to say because one event. I mean, insurance companies are trying to balance a portfolio over a long period of time. Um, they they rewrite their policies on an annual basis. Reinsurance companies, many people not know, there's an entire sector that insures insurance companies will take a much longer view. And so sudden shifts from one storm to the next. This will, the payouts will affect their profit and loss statement, no question. Uh, whether that leads them to adjust their premiums, one event, maybe. But it's the trend of events. It's it's uh, the signal of where this is going. One of the challenges for insurance companies right now is they base all their projections on actuarial data. What happened over the last 10 or 20 years is going to tell us what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years. But if that actuarial data is no good anymore, if what used to be a 100-year storm is now a 20-year storm, they have to come up with new kinds of models and new kinds of adjustments. So they're going to get much more conservative as they're trying to figure out how to price their instruments in order to provide the proper risk coverage. So I will do less hedging and I, I will go out and look here. <laughs> so I I will say, given what, we, what Florida has experienced with Helene and now with Milton, which is going to be catastrophic, I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to foresee that there will be changes for the state. I mean, Florida has a uh, is the insurer of last resort, so their citizens program, because they've already tried to roll people before any of these storms hit kind of off their program. And let's see, you know, how citizens itself will fare when they have to pay out claims associated with these two disasters. And then I think Andy is making a really important point that I think often gets lost is when you buy a home or when you rent a place, you don't necessarily anticipate to move again in a year, but your insurance policy renews within 12 months. And so in terms of being nimble and flexible, the insurance companies can adjust really quickly, you know, a few months after these events hit, they can decide we're not renewing the policies or we're getting out of the market for a little bit. But what are you going to do as the homeowner or as the renter? Because you can't renew your policy. You're not deciding, or at least not instantly deciding, you're going to leave or sell your house. So the, the disconnect in terms of time horizons and how insurance companies can act versus how we act as people, how often we move, is really diametrically opposed. And, you know, let's add to this. Um we, we talk about insured losses, but for every storm, at least the same amount of money, if not more, is uninsured. And that's swallowed by the individual homeowner or the municipality. Uh, so some people are going to get ruined by this, financially ruined. If their house is gone and they're uninsured, they're done. And as Melanie talked about, the, the backstop at the state level, um, the state level uh, insurance company, uh, citizens in Florida's case, uh, the, the state's been pumping money into that for years because, let's face it, whenever the the public sector moves into a market where the private sector pulls out, chances are you're not going to make any money, and they don't. Um, it is there as, a, as an insurer of last resort. FEMA is starting to change its underwriting policies. Uh, they're raising their rates, which is creating some lawsuits from states. But they're also, when they give you a payback, they're going to say, you're not rebuilding in the harm's way again. You're moving someplace else. And there's, there's a lot of pushback from that. And then uh, lastly, I would just add that after a storm like this, the appraisers come in and try and figure out what we're going to pay. And they may say we're going to pay uh, the replacement value or we're going to pay asset value. And that's a big difference. I want a new roof. No, but your roof was old. We're going to give you what the roof was worth. You're going to make up the difference. Or they're going to say that was flood. That was hurricane. You're covered for hurricane. You're not covered for flood. And this is all we'll cover. And there has been pressure from the state to get people to get more and more flood insurance because most people, the vast majority of people don't think they need it. And the vast majority do, because if you have water damage, is it storm, is it, is it wind or, or, or flood, uh, it makes a big difference on the payouts. Mm -hmm. and, and just to really sort of clarify that point, standard homeowners insurance does not cover flooding. 
correct? That's right. So you need separate right. flood insurance. And if you live in a um, what what the federal government has statistics show is a likely to flood zone, um, you often have to get flood insurance to get a government backed mortgage. Well, and to add to that, a lot of the flood maps are obsolete. Uh, when we, you have 100-year storms now becoming 20-year storms, what used to be not a flood zone is a flood zone, and the maps aren't keeping up. There's been a lot of pressure on the government to update those maps. Plus, a lot of times these maps, they are very much drawn in relation to flooding that comes from a stream or a creek, riverine flooding, but not necessarily the flooding that occurs when you have a, a tremendous thunderstorm and it dumps all that rain into a city or in a town, and then the drainage system can't cope with it, and all of a sudden the water starts backing up because the drainage system is, you know, not fast enough. And that mm -hmm. kind of flooding is not on the map. But damage from that kind of flooding requires flood insurance. So there is really a huge under under reporting or declaration, if you will, of flood risk when you look at these flood maps. Mm -hmm. I just yesterday, coincident had it, I taught floods in my class. And the bottom line is where it rains, it floods. If it floods, you have flood risk. Mm -hmm. and so let, like let, in Arizona, I, you have flood risk. Oh, we do. Yeah, we have Correct. tremendous flesh flood risk. Seasonal flood risk, but yes. still a flood mm -hmm. risk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and this is across the board of the, 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 the new kinds of extreme weather causing new kinds of problems. These heat waves causing asphalt to buckle or get soft. Uh, um, uh, heat waves causing metal roofs to buckle. Hail... Iowa had a hailstorm, hail the size of um, um, of softballs. I mean, this is this is the these are extremely damaging events that were extremely rare if they happened before, and now they're happening with more frequency, with greater greater catastrophe. If you have hail hail so, uh, stones that big, uh, a it would be very dangerous for you to be outside. If you're a farmer, your livestock are now in very big uh, serious jeopardy. Uh, your crops, I mean, hail has always been a disaster for crops, but a hail that big, you can kiss it goodbye. Right. Yeah. And, and we'll mention there that crop insurance, which is something that most U.S. farmers rely a lot on, is, is provided by the federal government sure. or, or the federal government sets rates and private insurers do right. it within that program. That's all done through the farm bill. But so there is taxpayer dollars that are going to help insure farmers crops and things like that. Um, let's start with some questions from listeners, because we have some. Um, so one interesting question, this is from Eric Niederhofer, asks, will insurance rates drive where and how people live? Is that something you expect to see? Yes, absolutely. Um, it, well, people need to become smart about this. I mean, you're going to have to get insurance before you get your mortgage. And no, no banks are going to give you a mortgage without insurance. And, and you're going to find out. Uh, over the last seven years, uh, insurance, home insurance rates in this country have gone up over 20%. Some states, five states, insurance, home insurance went up over 50% in seven years. If you're buying a home and you're not paying attention to that, you're, you're really making a big mistake. And so as it becomes a bigger part of your monthly payment, tack that onto the top of your mortgage. If you can't afford it, you're underwater. And so it will drive people to think differently about the houses they buy. And let's hope it drives changes in building standards, um, how we build. Um, that, that, is, that has got to change. That has to happen. Um, uh, right now, we're building in a way that is not prepared for these kinds of events, and, uh, and we need to change that. We see in, in California right now, mm -hmm home sales where the buyer actually has a, has a clause in the contract saying, if I cannot find insurance for this property, I'm not buying the home. No, oh, they're off the hook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw a figure um, from a New York Times story this morning that said that average home insurance premiums across the U.S. have risen 33% uh, in the, from 2020 to 23. So again, it's oh. not, you know, they're probably worse in some states, but, but it's, yep. It's something happening across the board. So that leads us to another question from a listener, which is, um, while the need for insurance is clear, what prevents the industry from using this essential um, uh, commodity to indulge in predatory behavior? Great question. Hard um, not to wonder when you see the scale of some of these increases. It, You know, yes. Could companies gouge? Um, maybe. I think a better way to look at it, I mean, first of all, the state is going to um, approve whether they have a rate increase. So th they're watching. Um, but 
the question becomes more nuanced because you've got an insurance company and they're trying to balance three things. They don't want to price it too high that they price themselves out of the market. They don't want to price it too low where they can't cover their payouts. And they don't want to run a follow regulators. There's the challenge, those three things. Um, but uh, as the... Um, as they start to look at the data, and each insurance company is going to do this on their own, they're saying, how do we cover this risk? We're going to price it this much. Some may do it more conservatively. Some may do it less conservatively. If you do it more conservatively, you charge more money, you have more premiums coming in. Let's say the storms that were anticipated don't happen. Now they have a windfall. Was that predatory? Not really. They were just trying to be careful. How does that affect the homeowner? Well, they paid more than they had to, but we also have to look over a longer period of time because insurance companies will run a loss for a number of years in one particular sector, hopefully covering it in others. They, they lose money in homeowners, they cover it in auto coverage. Uh, and, but over time, they have to get into the black or they, they're, gonna, they're gonna close up shop and leave the state, which is often what happens either because they don't wanna cover the risk or the state won't let them raise the rates to a level that they feel is necessary to cover the risks. But it's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from a condo owner in Houston that is by a bayou that has been widened um, and the first floor is flooded years ago. Um, what tools do you suggest to educate our 277 units occupants? So there is quite a lot of resources actually out on the, on the web where you can obviously read up on, you know, what's your risk, your return periods, et cetera. But I think one really important component is, and you mentioned that you're in Texas. So Texas is one of the states that has some disclosure regulation. And so I'm wondering, you know, maybe what kind of information has been disclosed to you or your fellow tenants in terms of what the risk is in, in that building. There's something called the clue report. Uh, I need to, I forgot what it's called. The abbreviation is so handy that I always forget what the acronym stands for. But it allows you, it it forces your realtor, et cetera, to pull information of how many times the home was flooded, et cetera. And so that is a really good tool to kind of coax out some information on past losses, past events. Because I think it's really, I find shocking that for the biggest investment most of us make, we can get something like a Carfax report. We can get it for a car. How can I not find out how many times this home has experienced damage from hails and floods, et cetera. So there are some tools, but I'm sorry to say there is really no mechanism where you get a full disclosure of what happened to that building or that condo unit over the last 50 years. That simply doesn't exist because we don't have disclosure laws that require that. Um, I'll mention, I was doing a story years ago about flooding in the Norfolk area, which is a very, very flood prone area because they, first of all, they've created, it's Norfolk is right on the Virginia coast, has a huge naval base by it. There's lots of canals into the neighborhoods. Then a lot of, you know, sale ads will say, you can kayak from your backyard. Um, but the net, the ground there is also sinking. It's a big subsidence area. So, so they have bad, bad flooding. Um, and I, was down there and, and going around the city with someone I knew from past work who had become a um, sort of climate advocate and was very involved in work down there. And he would show me these signs of areas that had flooded. So like you would be in a park that was near a canal or something. And he said, if you can see all this dead grass along one side, salt waters, that's been covered with salt water. Um, same thing on streets that were near, near the water areas, like you have rusty stains on the curbs. He said, that's salt water. So uh, it, there may be, you know, one thing maybe to talk to um, people who are really savvy about the environmental conditions locally, they might be able to tell you some things like that. You know, that may be one way to sort of research things that so Jenny, your don't point necessarily just, want to tell you. <laughs> your point just reminded me in Texas, you have a nonprofit group called the Anthropocene Alliance that exactly, you know, is trying to bring these past risks to the fore. And then also... If you live in a community that participates in the National Flood Insurance Program, you probably have a local floodplain manager. And that could also be an official that you could approach and say, hey, we need to have risk mitigation, flood risk mitigation in my neighborhood. And then, you know, through maybe some advocacy and pushing, maybe, you know, you get some um, flood risk reduction projects on the docket. Maybe we <laughs> should I... back up a little bit and talk oh, about oh, what oh, the oh, National oh, Flood Insurance Program okay. does. 
Sorry. But I want to add, I want to add one quick thing here because we can all focus on you know the negatives and and they are there and they are very real. Uh, but Melanie has highlighted an opportunity for any budding entrepreneurs out there. Is there a way to develop a business out around around the idea of Carfax for Homes? Um, mm -hmm. We have AI right now. You could sweep the web, find out news stories of when there have been major events in particular areas. Could you actually provide that kind of a service? I suspect banks, insurance companies, and homeowners would equally love to see that data if you could if you could if you could compile it. And you're solving a classic economic problem, right? Asymmetric information. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So let's 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 back up and just um, say a little bit about the National Flood Insurance Program and how it works, because that's come up a couple of times and people may not be familiar of it. Uh, Melanie, is that something you can just sort of yeah, briefly. explain so, a little the, the key things about it? So Andy mentioned it earlier. So that's a program. I think we started in 1969, something like that. It's a federally run program. Anybody who has flood insurance, very often you interact with your maybe state farm or all state agent, but it's actually not those private companies that write the policy. They just help administer it. So it's a federal program. And then based on what Jenny said earlier, rates are set very much based on your flood risk. Are you within a 100 year floodplain, within a 500 year, or are you outside? And especially when you're outside, you have a very low um, premium to pay. So you can buy flood insurance outside one of those risk zones. Got it. Um. We have a question from James who wants to know, how can the average person understand all of the details of insurance requirements and coverage? Is there a good place to turn for help? Parsing some of this information overload. So I think, A, I struggle with that myself. I have a very hard time interpreting legalese and all these contracts are their own language. I think one of the key factors when you look at your homeowner's insurance policy is to look at which hazards, very often they are called perils in the written document, which ones are covered? Because in every state it's different. And then figuring out, okay, these things are covered under my homeowner's insurance policy. So then are there additional risks that I need to cover? Okay, do I need to cover flood risk? Then you need to buy flood insurance. Maybe you also have wildfire risk. Maybe there's a separate policy in your state. Maybe you have earthquake risk and you need to buy a separate policy for that. So it's very much a piecemeal approach. But I would suggest maybe a, a good realtor might be able to help with that kind of information. But I might go further. We we used to rely on insurance agents. Uh, they are still out mm -hmm. there. Um, go find a local insurance agent who can walk through these policies with you and help you understand them. We've all moved towards online self-serve, whether it's um, uh, Gecko or um, Geico or um, mm -hmm. Progressive. Um, that makes it cheaper because they have very little brick and mortar presence. Um, but that brick and mortar presence brings expertise that can help you make sense out of this. Very true. Um, Carol B asks, if you can project 10 to 20 years in the future, what might the U.S. market for homeowners insurance look like in terms of things like provider costs and profitability, insurance availability, secondary insurance, premium pricing and regulatory actions? Well, there's a lot Companies of would probably How, love to how know big that is too. your crystal ball, Andy? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, wow. I'll I'll take a I'll take a swag at this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Costs will go up. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that. Out. Coverage will get tighter. Um, um, will we cover? Uh, you know, roofs. Will we cover the car? That's uh, who knows. But the the coverage will become much tighter. But more importantly, you know, as insurance companies start to throw up their hands and pull out of places like Florida and California, there has to be, there has to be a give. And that give has to be in terms of building standards, in terms of uh, resilient infrastructure. We, we have to change how we build. So I do think that we'll be become much more aware what, what is now considered forward thinking practice, which actually is not. I mean, building sector moves so slowly, um, and particularly in the home building sector. I used to be a home builder. Um, but we're going to become much more savvy with hurricane bracing, with um, with proper uh, wetlands. Uh, you know, uh, Houston figured that out after Hurricane Harvey, that all those wetlands that they thought were worthless and they filled in to put in condos, they suddenly realized they need them. And so I think we're going to be try and try to build in much more 
uh, harmony and awareness of nature around us. Uh, we've gotten away from that. There was a time, there's a, a whole idea called vernacular architecture. In the southeast or southwest, you built with adobe. It's high thermal mass. Now we stick frame. That's dumb. Let's go back to uh, you know high thermal mass. In the southeast, you had cracker architecture where the wind could just blow through. It keeps it cool. But now, again, we stick frame. Uh, everything's stick framed. Stick framing is not the most solid, you know, strong construction technique, um, especially if you don't use proper wind, um, wind bracing to hold the roof down, hold the walls stable. So I, I do think we're going to see some changes in the way we build, and it's going to be out of pure necessity. Um, the highest insurance market in the country is Florida, and um, it, it, it's just going to get more and more expensive until it starts to really, really affect the real estate industry, and it already is. And the real estate industry has been holding back progress. Now, in the, now, now they need to start to be more proactive and push it forward. So building on what Andy said, so I do think that building practices might be a mechanism um, to really incentivize risk reduction and might give you, you know, a reduction in your premium. I think right now, risk reduction at the home level is not really necessarily, is not really priced into the premium. But I think once we become smarter and maybe it could be sort of a competitive mechanism for companies to say, hey, we're going to give you a discount if you have X. So that could become a factor. And then on the other hand, we could see, I mean, in 25 years, that's a long time. We could see possibly substantial changes to how the market is run right now. Maybe we see public-private partnerships, not, you know, entirely public or not entirely private, but maybe a mix of it. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, we are at a precipice where we really need to, or at the state level, very often regulators have to decide, you know, how are we going to deal with the fact that private sec private companies are pulling out? Because mm -hmm. residents have, you have to have to insure. You have to have insurance. We talked about that very early on. If people are uninsured, they cannot recover. And we definitely don't want to have that. Yeah. Well, risk reduction, I mean, it's very standard with some kinds of insurance for car insurance. And I think most people probably have these things, you know, especially for your kids, because Teenage drivers are the most expensive <laughs> to insure. So, you know, if they, um, I mean, we had a we had a thing in our policy where if they had, you know, a really high grade point average in school, we got a discount from it. If, of course, if they took driver's ed, we they got a discount from it. Um, if you have um, certain safety devices, you got a discount. Things like that. So, yeah, it seems as though building that into uh, that kind of thing into insurance, home insurance, could uh, could be a pretty straightforward thing to do. Um, we have a funkier question here. Um, about parametric insurance and how it could be a solution for communities. Um, parametric insurance is index-based. It covers the probability of an event rather than the actual losses. Is this something either of you have encountered? You want to give it a shot, Andy? No, do you want to give it a shot, <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I mean, I'm not an insurance expert, but from my vantage point, I think parametric insurance is really covering a space in terms of, you know, gauging the risk that has not been occupied, explored well enough. So I think it's, yes, it's it's a mechanism that could help. But to Andy's point, our losses are increasing. Yeah. And different insurance mechanisms, programs, tools do not necessarily take away from that. You know, the losses will, we will continue incurring these losses. And what are we going to do about them? Insurance is just one mechanism. And, you know, I don't, I honestly, I, I'm going to confess, I don't know anything about parametric insurance, mm -hmm. but I do like this opening up, this tying with the last question. Will there be policy instruments that we aren't even thinking about today that will be present in 25 years? I mean, the insurance sector is quite innovative. I, I was talking to an, um, someone at Swiss Re one time, and they have developed uh, terrorist insurance. They can actually figure out how to assess yeah. your risk and provide you with a policy that will protect you from terrorism. If they can, if they can give that kind of policy, they they they're, they can be very innovative. They're just they're running numbers, calculating risk, and seeing an opportunity to to provide something that people need. And so, will all policies look like they look today? Uh, I think this this question raises an interesting possibility that there may be instruments that we haven't even thought about that will be present in 2025 or 25 years from now. Mm -hmm. I mean, in in Japan, for instance, the, this, the government serves as the reinsurer. 
So if you have earthquake insurance in Japan, it's, it's a private insurance program, but there are caps to how much um, private insurance have to pay out. And then the, the government kicks in. That could also be something, you know, where you know, okay, there is a max cap of what you as a, as a private entity have to expend. And, and we do that with nuclear power plants. Um, you want to build a nuclear power plant, your liability is capped and the federal government will take the risk beyond that. Otherwise, they wouldn't get built. No insurance company is going to go in for the whole, the, whole, uh, the whole book on a nuclear power plant. And that's a social decision. Yeah. That we want nuclear power, so we will do that. Um, right. We have another question also in kind of the wonky zone um, about how insurers determine how much coverage a homeowner can get. Are the algorithms used at point of sale to estimate the cost of reconstruction and thus the coverage limits for the home? Um, and hence, is, does that create a problem with rising rates? Is is the question whether they're going to give um, uh, replacement cost versus assessing the value of the asset? Um, if I have a 20-year-old roof and it gets damaged in a hailstorm, I want a new roof, but an insurance company can say your your roof was 20 years old. We're going to give you what we assess to be the value of it, which is probably close to zero, quite frankly, because if it's an asphalt roof, most shingles are uh, 10, 15, 20 years at the most. Um, if if that's the question, that that's certainly in there, and insurance companies are going to try and contract and and protect their uh, their bottom line, and so they will, I think, oftentimes move away from replacement value. Uh, you, yeah, just think about it with your car. You have a ten-year-old car. You total it. Does that mean you get a brand new of the model you had? No, you get a you know, the asset value. And so, uh, I think that's what the questioner is asking. Is it? I, as far as I can tell, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, to me, this question kind of links to the earlier question about you know how can I understand what's in my policy? That mm -hmm. I think is also one of the key aspects to look at. Do you have replacement value, or you know some other? legalese language in there on what you're going to get um, paid out when something happens, because they can be differences. It's not a default. Yeah. And when we think about, you know, homeowners becoming more sophisticated, that's also a decision for you. If you have a 20 year old roof, do you want to insure it when the coverage is going to be asset value? Probably not. And so pull, if you, if you can now, you know, have a, an insurance policy that allows you to, uh, pull in and pull out different assets. That may be something we'll have in 25 years too. I'll, I'll, I'll cover my glass, but not my roof. I'll cover my roof, but not the walls. I'll cover my aluminum siding, but I won't cover the driveway. It, the, these choices may allow you a menu of approaching insurance. And again, uh, you at certain points may decide, like anyone with a really old car, uh, chances are it's smart to insure the people because the cost of a, a medical trip and an ambulance ride is very, very high, but insuring the car makes no sense because you're paying for the car in one, two, three years. Maybe you're willing to roll the dice and say, I don't think I'm going to total it in those three years and I'm going to come out ahead. I mean, businesses do this all the time. I mean, uh, for a good time, Stanford University was self-insuring because earthquake insurance on those beautiful stone buildings was just, was just too high. So companies mm -hmm. self-insure all the time. Individuals can too. But you have um, to do it. You have to understand what you're doing. That this whole thing, I think, revolves around the, the idea that you need to understand how insurance works. You need to understand the diversity of policies. You need to understand your risk, and you have to act accordingly. And and make another plug for the local insurance agent, which has been falling out of favor in 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 recent years. I used to go to one like 30 years ago. I don't do it anymore. I go go online. But maybe that's not a good idea anymore. Don't treat your insurance policy like you treat the license agreements you have to sign when iTunes, you know, updates on your computer or something. <laughs> That's a great right, 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 exactly. Click <laughs> all the way to the bottom. Um, one other thing that relates to information about insurance is I'll just point out that um, insurance is becoming a political issue in a lot of states. Um, for example, the woman who is running against Rick Scott in the Senate race in Florida is airing a commercial specifically saying, Rates have gone up, rates have quadrupled, and Rick Scott didn't do anything about it as governor. Um, you know, now whether he could have or not is something that Floridians would know better than I would. But um, but in Hawaii, a congressman lost a race because he was argued that he didn't do enough about condo insurance rates going up. And there are 12 states where insurance commissioner, commissioner is an elected position, uh, including in North Carolina, where there's a race right now. And you can certainly imagine that ins insurance is on a lot of people's minds right now. So if you're in a state 
where insurance is being discussed in the elections, that certainly is an opportunity, I think, to understand how your state does it and um, what sort of particular types of insurance are at issue in your state and what people think about it. So something yeah. to look at. And I mean, yeah, you could be very lax and allow insurance companies to keep raising their rates uh, without any kind of controls. But um, the extent of control that that um, the government has on, on private insurance companies, I mean, California has been trying to force insurance companies to stay in the state. Uh, the courts are going to have a really hard time with that one because if I'm a private company and I decide the state isn't a place where I want to do business, how do you force them to stay? Um, this is going to get really, really tricky. But the the again, going back to where I started, the rippling effects of insurance through the economy. I mean, the the whole real estate sector depends on insurance. And if insurance starts to dry up or become prohibitively expensive, the real estate market comes to a standstill. And, and that's that's the importance of this uh, that we need to really grapple with because again uh, just to re re repeat how i started without insurance you you really can't do anything so to me in the insurance challenges we're facing right now are the result and not the cause so i feel like in these political discussions it's mm -hmm. it's it's so quick to mm -hmm. point at the insurance companies as being the problems but that is not really where the problem lies. The problem lies that the local jurisdiction and the state have not invested in risk reduction. They place citizens, you know, give permits for development in high risk zones. And then people buying these buildings are left out hanging, you know, now having to find insurance coverage for that home. So the problem started with the local jurisdiction allowing the developer to go into that space. Or you know, not in not managing their stormwater runoff appropriately, et cetera. That's where really the problem lies. The insurance challenges we are facing is really just a symptom. And so mm -hmm. in in the examples that you gave, I get reminded of I'm originally from Germany. And if the German government didn't like a policy they had to implement, they would point at the European Union. But it's this to me, it's <laughs> yeah. the same thing, you know. The problem is not with the insurance company. The problem is really with your local jurisdiction or your state. What mm -hmm. kind of building code have they adopted? Do you really even have a decent building code that gives you some buffer for climate change? Or do they just require the bare minimum? And, you know, let's let's in our remaining time, let's let's bring this up because. Everything that Melanie said is just nailing the head, hitting the nail right on the head that Insurance premiums are just the canary in the coal mine. They're just calling out, they're the signal that something's wrong. And so what is the state or what is the government going to do or what is industry going to do? There are ways to make changes within the industry that industry can actually promote. And then at the same time, I mean, you have to, you have to call this climate change. Mm -hmm. You can just say, well, there's increased storm severity, but without capturing the real root of the problem and that this is the new normal and the new normal normal is a problematic word because it's highly chaotic insurance company if, if storms just went up that opening graph you had jenny if storms are just yeah. a straight line upward trend insurance companies can price that that's predictable the fact is it's so erratic and how do you price something that's so unpredictable and it's becoming not just more severe, but more unpredictable? And there, there's the rub. And if you don't call it climate change, you just say more extreme weather, that suggests some predictability to it. And it's not there. Right. Well, and I think the, the diversity of types of disasters is a really important thing to take from this, because some years it's wildfires that really drive these billion dollar um, you know, event lists this year, it's been flooding other years, it could be drought. So, and, and we have lots of coverage that gets into this climate science and connecting climate change with all of these types of events, making them more frequent, making them more intense or hotter or drier or whatever the variable may be. So, so yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think, um, that, you know, recognizing that that's going on is really a big piece of this. Um, let's see, we are just about close to an hour. So, um, thank you so much, both of you for your views for this and, are there um, any questions that you wish we had asked or things, just last points you'd like to make? I thought this was a good discussion. I enjoyed it. Um, I just think- I'm gonna that... out you, Andy, and tell people you used to be a builder. <laughs> I, I, already, I think I already said yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I, 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 
the most well, important. He knows, he knows from stick framing. <laughs> uh, but the, the most important asset anyone's going to home own in their life is their home. Uh, everything is invested in that home. And we, we need to learn how to buy better homes and we need to know how to protect them. And climate change is not just a continuation of more bad weather. It's more extreme weather, more diverse weather, and more erratic weather. And uh, we, need to, we need to call this out, say it for what it is, in order to properly deal with this, this new and, quite frankly, unprecedented challenge. Yeah, I think the, to Andy's point, I think you have to get risk smart. You have to get risk literate. There is no way around it because there is a no central place where we can go to get all this information. And right now you have to piecemeal it together. You kind of have to make these trade-offs as an individual. Okay, these are the risks I'm facing from floods and from hurricanes. And then am I willing to take the risk or do I need to invest in insurance or elevating your home, et cetera? And you have to make these decisions. There, there's no way around it. Is that roof deck really a good idea? <laughs> or what have you yeah or that gave okay. you roof. yes right exactly well on that note i think we're probably at a good spot to wrap up and send people back into the world feeling sobered <laughs> and aware of risks <laughs> apologies that it's so depressed that's what we're here for thank, you, thank you all for joining and you know we have lots of coverage of the science of these things and of different types of weather events and things like that if you have issues you're interested in knowing about um please let us know and thank you, Jenny, for running a great discussion. Really appreciate well, thank, it. It was thank you my so pleasure. Much. Thank you.